Hello, and welcome to The Writing Coach. I'm your host, Kevin Johns, and on this podcast, I speak with the instructors, editors, coaches, and mentors that help writers and authors create their art, build their audience, and sell their work. In this episode, I speak with author and podcaster, Ani Alexander. The writer in its natural habitat, you know? I finally got it. I don't believe in drills. As a former teacher, I believe in authentic writing and and really getting into your story. I think it's each one of our responsibilities that when we learn a particular craft, I think it's kind of your responsibility to share it so that we can take storytelling to a new level. My mom doesn't understand. My dog just doesn't seem to get it when I talk to him. But when I go to my mastermind group, they get it. They understand we speak the common language. Keep writing. Keep creating. Never, ever stop. Life doesn't stop. So we got to keep on creating to continue creating the life that we want to create. You're listening to You're listening the to right. The right. The right. The right. The right. Hello, beloved listeners, and welcome back to The Writing Coach. It's your host, author, ghostwriter, and writing coach, Kevin Johns here. Now, you've heard it. I know you've heard it. You need to build an author platform. And what the heck is an author platform anyway? Well, sure, it can be your website. It could be a blog. It makes sense. If you're a writer, writing a blog might be the best way to build an audience and connect with readers. But another great way of building an author platform is podcasting. Hey, you're listening to a podcast right now. That's why I was really excited to get an opportunity to talk with Ani Alexander. Ani's an author, she's a brand coach, and she's the host of the popular podcast, Right to be Read, which she hosted for over 150 episodes. Yeah, 150, before rebranding under the brand new title, Brand Architect. We have a really great discussion. During it, Ani describes the moment that inspired her to quit her corporate job after almost a decade to pursue podcasting and writing. How a random connection via Facebook led to her writing a best-selling book. Why she built her author platform around podcasting instead of blogging. What it was like being the only podcaster in all of Armenia. What she learned from having over 150 conversations about writing and publishing. The role persistence and consistency played in her success. Why she decided to rebrand her podcast and how the new show is going to help listeners grow their audience. And how she overcame limiting beliefs about charging for her services and sharing her expertise. And much, much more. It's a great conversation. So let's cut to that interview now. So you're an author, you're a fellow podcaster like myself, and you're working with authors, you're coaching, and you're launching a new brand. Tell the listeners all about all these various things that you've got on the go. Bring them up to speed with your world. Okay. Well, yes, I am I am an author. I'm a best-selling author, but I write fiction, which is really interesting because I usually work with non-fiction writers. So that's like the, the, the interesting part of it. Um, so basically how everything started was uh, I worked in the corporate for about 15 years. I, uh, I had a relatively successful career. I had a nice job and I, um, I left. So everyone thought I was crazy. No one could really understand how can someone leave without having a plan in place. Uh, but I didn't have a plan in place. So basically, I took a few months off to sort of, you know, figure out what I wanted to do next. And that's exactly when I met my friend with whom I lost touch for about 16, 17 years because I moved countries and there was no internet back then. So we sort of lost each other. And she found me on Facebook. 
And she told me about what happened to her during the period when where we lost touch. And I could see it just in front of my eyes like a, like a movie. And I was like, you know, this is a ready book. You should write a book about that. And she was like, you know, I can't write. Uh, you know, it's something you do. So t- just, you know, take my uh, life story, do whatever you want. If you want to write it, it's okay. You can write it. And that, and I usually um, used to write since my teenage years. So I started from poems and then short stories and uh, flash fiction and all that stuff. So usually I, I was blogging too so everything was sort of in a short short form thing and so I started writing her um, a novel based on her true life story and that was the first thing ever that I wrote and was longer than three to four pages long so I did that as a part of the NaNoWriMo national novel sure. writing and um, it eventually became an Amazon bestseller so after that, I uh, I wrote uh, another one. So right now I have three books out there, uh, Emotional Moments, which is uh, a book of short stories, and two more novels, High Fall and Dream Down. So both of them are based on uh, true life stories. I don't have the courage to write my own life story yet, so I haven't gone there yet. But that brought me to an idea like, okay, you know, when I was just starting, when I wrote that novel, I had no idea what I was going to do with that. So I dig into self-publishing and Amazon, and I researched the internet. I made all the classic mistakes newbie writers do. I created my own cover. It looks terrible. I sort of, you know, my text wasn't professionally edited and all that stuff. So eventually I figured it out, and I was like, you know, there are loads of people who actually are in my shoes and don't know how to do things and don't have the time to figure things out, etc. Why? What if I came up with a place where everyone can find out everything they need to find out about everything? So I thought like, yeah, but blogging does not seem to work so well. And I was going to start from scratch because I didn't have an audience. I mean, fiction readers are not exactly those I was going to do it for. So I was basically starting from scratch. I bought my domain name. Anne Alexander is actually my pen name, so I was like, you know, creating a completely new brand from scratch. And um, so I didn't know what to do, and I wasn't sure that the blogging was going to be the right way to go. So I discovered this thing, which was podcasting, and it sounded really nice, but I wasn't sure that, you know, I should, you know, I, I could do that because I was like, who the hell is going to listen to someone with accent, first of all? And the second thing was like, I thought it was very complicated and the equipment was very expensive and all that stuff. So once I figured out that it's not true and you could start with an investment of $100, basically that's what I did and and then I sent out to several of my friends abroad a few small recordings and they said yeah you know the accent is is not that bad we can understand everything you're saying no problem with that so that's how the podcast right to be read was launched and I was happy enough to sort of you know lend the new and noteworthy place overall on the home page and it stayed there for five weeks And that's how I gained my initial audience, which is really cool. But then you have to keep the audience and to make them come back to you. And uh, so that I did by selecting very carefully all the guests and also making sure that each interview provides value or a tip or, you know, something that the listeners would need to have and to find out. So, and I also don't prepare things in advance, which means that with free flows, um, this helps me make sure that episodes are not like each other. So it's not like, you know, the same thing over and over again. And um, so, so far it's been, uh, it will be like in about a week, it will be exactly two years old. And since we covered everything about book marketing and self-publishing, and, and that is something that listeners are telling me, not me, uh, I decided that, okay, let's think about what happens with people who already publish a book and already have gone through the first phase. What do they need next? And apparently they need to have their author brand out there. So, And they need an audience and to grow their audiences. And then I thought, yeah, but this is not something only writers need to do, right? We, we, we have coaches, we have uh, speakers, we have online solopreneurs and all those people who sort of create really nice content, not only books. 
but uh, they are not visible. No one knows they exist, and you know they are missing out a lot. So that is how I sort of rebranded the podcast. Now it's called Brand Architect, and it's mainly going to help everyone who needs to establish their brands and to grow their audiences. Because exactly two years ago, that that's where I started, and that's what I did. So I'm, I'm going to share my knowledge and also get really nice um, guests who obviously know much more and better than I do. <laughs> so I want to go back for a second there. You know, you were like, and so then I, then I quit my job and wrote a best-selling book and started a podcast. I mean, I think there's so many people who would love to do that, but who are probably too scared to do it or don't feel like they have the skills or what. What was making that decision like to say, you know, after 10 years in a corporate career, say, I can turn my back on that and I'm going to go into this crazy world of publishing and authorship and entrepreneurialism. Well, I mean, I have to make a disclaimer. I mean, I have a family and uh, we have a son. So obviously you can't really sort of, you know, I had my husband who I have husband who has a really nice job. So I had the backup, which means that, you know, if I didn't, I might have thought much harder about that. And I realized that, you know, this financial burden is something that keeps many people in places where they want, don't want to be. Uh, so I was really lucky in that sense. On the other hand, my uh, my corporate world uh, job was uh, very hectic. I had loads of overtime. I, I had trouble balancing it with my family. So I was sort of, you know, in two stage where I couldn't take it anymore. I developed neurosis. I didn't sleep well and all that stuff. So I realized that this is not worth it anymore. It's not, I mean, it's too expensive uh, for my life to have this nice job and I guess the last thing that sort of made me realize that no this is it I just have to quit was one morning I was driving uh, to work and I really didn't feel like to, I mean every morning I was waking up really unhappy because I had to go there and I realized like okay I mean let's understand why are you doing this like what is the best case scenario if you do this for 10 years What's going to happen? And I realized, like, okay, what's going to happen is maybe, and it's very improbable, but maybe I will become the CEO of the, the company, right? And I realized, like, hey, but I don't want that. I don't want to be the CEO. And then I realized that, you know, this is really stupid, doing something you don't really want to do in order to get where you don't want to be. And meanwhile, sort of, you know, losing most of your day in that place. So I realized that this is not right. I didn't know what was right. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have a plan in place. But, the, you know, the realization that what I'm doing right now is really wrong. And, you know, the, when if I quit much later, I will just regret about the time that I lost. Uh, I sort of realized that, you know, in any case, this is the wrong thing. So even if I, I'm going to work again somewhere else, I should do it wisely and I should just quit, take my time and understand what to do. So it's very difficult. I mean, many people, for many people, it's easier in a way that they knew what their passion was and they knew where to go once they had the chance. For me, it was the other way around. It's just, you know, very coincidences, which usually, I mean, looking back, they weren't coincidences. They were just signs. But for me, it was like I didn't know where it would lead me to. So I had no idea what would happen. And once you were doing the podcast, I mean, you did over 100 episodes, right? 158. 158 <laughs> episodes. So, I mean, that shows some real dedication and some real passion for that. So over that journey of, of 150 episodes of a podcast that a lot of people listen to and enjoyed, what did you learn along the way of having those 150 converse, or 158 conversations? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the first very important thing was that when I was starting the podcast, I wasn't really, I didn't know what to expect. So for me, it was just an experiment. I was like, uh, you know, I had these doubts about the accent. I had these doubts about the technical stuff and all these things. Um, but the thing is, usually I move really fast. So from the time I realized that, yes, I want to have a podcast, and I had no idea what that was, and I was the only podcaster. I was living back in Armenia, and I was the only podcaster in Armenia. So, you know, there wasn't even anyone around who knew what it was to sort of, you know, pick their brain and stuff like that. So uh, from the moment I realized that I wanted to, do, to try that until the moment I launched my podcast, it took me three weeks 
So I was watching the tutorials to find out how things work. I was recording parallel already the interviews and I was working on the concepts, the branding, the naming and all that stuff. So it took me three weeks. And for me, it was I think why it worked was I wasn't so serious and I wasn't batting too much on that. So I was like, what the hell? Let's try it and see what happens. So for me, uh, in the beginning, it was just, you know, having fun, trying things out. It's new. It's fresh. And, and I enjoy meeting new people and I enjoy talking. So it was really sort of, you know, something that was in line uh, with my personality. So in the very beginning, what, what I learned was, in the very beginning, you have this feeling that you're talking to yourself because you are looking at the stats. They are not very encouraging. You know, uh, people haven't discovered you yet, so they don't know who you are. It's a bit tough to get guests because uh, obviously, you know, usually they, they need some credibility, some proofs, you know, some, something. Usually the, the first thing they are asking is like, you know, how big is your audience? And if you are starting, of course, it's not big. So I guess uh, the most important thing looking back was sticking around for a certain period of time. Because in the very beginning, for several weeks, you won't see any traction. You will uh, not get so much engagement. You will not get emails from listeners. You will. It will be tough for you to start getting reviews and all that stuff. So for, for the beginning, you feel like, you know, what's going on? Is it going to be like this forever? And you don't even know how long it will take to get that traction. So I guess what I learned was the important thing is once you realize what why you are doing that, and for me, the main mission was to help writers to become successful authors. I was just making sure that I'm putting out stuff consistently and whatever I'm putting out is of a good quality and it's really helpful. So I think that is what sort of, you know, it, it brought people in, but it also kept them in because, because it wasn't, you know, I didn't miss any episode in the first one year. I mean, I was doing... Uh, two episodes per week, and I never, ever missed anything. So later on, when something happened and I missed it, I was receiving emails saying, you know, what happened? Did you stop podcasting? Because they were, you know, so used to getting it on time exactly. So I guess just, you know, not giving up, sticking around for a while until destruction comes in. Because later on, it's so easy in terms of the emotional support mechanism. You're getting fan mail, you're getting feedback, you're receiving uh, reviews, you are seeing the stats sort of, you know, grow. And it's much easier to, you know, whenever you feel like, ah, oh, you know, I don't really feel like recording anything, just going back to that and sort of, you know, getting energy from there. So when did you start working one-on-one -on -one with authors? Because I think you do some coaching work, right? Oh, yes. I'm actually, right now, I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one only with authors. So what I'm, I'm working is, I, I was just, <clears throat> it was a big challenge. Yesterday I was working on, on a page on my website, which would actually um, make people understand what I do and what I offer, because that was a bit confusing since there were several different elements, components, and it was it was very difficult to put it all in one place in a concise way. So, um, so I did that yesterday, finally, and it's on my website, which says work with me. And basically, there are several blocks. Uh, first of all, I'm working with authors, helping them with two things. The first thing is helping them with understand and going through the process of uh, turning their existing content into a book. So you don't really have to be a writer. Maybe you have a podcast, which can be converted and turned into a book. Maybe you have a blog. Maybe you have had many speaking gigs around a subject and you, you already have some things. So the idea is, if you're creating content online, most probably you already have most of the materials you will need for the book. And most probably you already have your audience and your ideal reader in mind. It's just a matter of, of, you know, just, you know, going through the content and turning it into a book. So this is the one thing which obviously is nonfiction books and what you have turning it into a book. Uh, the second thing is many writers and not only writers found this exciting world of podcasting. So I'm helping them with actually launching their podcast and if they already have a podcast which doesn't do so well, you know, working on different strategies of, you know, growing it. 
And the third thing, which sort of, you know, is the umbrella and covers everything, is um, working with clients in terms of finding their own brand story, like, you know, using the fiction, uh, being a fiction author and storytelling techniques, sort of pinpointing the most in- important message and interesting thing about their their story, their personal brand story. So using that and establishing the brand and creating an overall content strategy about how you get visibility and get noticed online. So, for example, everyone is very individual. Maybe, you know, not every, not podcasting is not for everyone, for example. It, it's, you know, it depends how you feel about that and all that stuff. Video is not for everyone. So it's basically developing a strategy which is in line with your personality developing a brand which is in line with your personality and coming up with an action plan of how exactly you can get noticed in this, you know, crowded online space and how you can differentiate and gain and keep loyal audience. When did you make that transition to to being someone podcasting about these issues to actually being someone coaching others on them? What, was it early on in the podcast or what did it happen midway through? Um, not really. I mean, we moved to London in January, so a few months ago. So before that, people sort of, you know, you know, people online, they usually uh, prefer to pick your brain uh, for free and, you know, um, ask different questions and then have a Skype call and all that stuff. So I realized that I was doing this for free most of the time anyway, because, uh, because, first of all, I had more t- free time, so I could dedicate that. Second, money wasn't such a big issue, so I was really happy to help for free. When we moved to to London, I mean, many things changed. Uh, so my husband became a full-time student, and uh, and London is a very expensive city. So I was thinking about ways to actually monetize what I was doing somehow. Because before that, it wasn't a bu- there was no business plan behind. There was, no, I mean, it was just about helping people and you know doing what you love. So it wasn't really uh, anything strategic in place. So I was looking back at you know what people might need, and I realized that you know this is something that I'm doing anyway, and this is something that people come to me for anyway. So uh, I had this problem uh, because I had this mindset of feeling guilty charging people and all that stuff but then I realized you know I, I worked on that a little bit and I realized that there are plenty of people who are doing you know who are not providing as much value but they're charging you know so much more so it's not really about sort of you know feeling guilty about charging people if you are doing a good job and if you are helping them and their business really grows and their brands are really visible. So I sort of had a mindset shift. I worked on on that a lot because that was the hardest part. So you just had a big pivot which you know must have been scary after building a great brand around right to be read switching over to the brand architect um tell me about that transition and tell me about you know the exciting work that you're going to do now under this kind of new umbrella brand of of brand architect well yeah that's right i mean it was a very painful pivot because uh i mean with my brain when i was looking back and looking at this as a business plan and all that stuff i realized that i had to do that but it was way beyond my comfort zone. And I was resisting it a lot. I was like, yeah, but I already have this audience. They are used to the podcast. You know, the topics are so familiar. And, you know, you never know if they will stick around later on if I pivot. You never know if you will get these new people and all that stuff. So I was really like, you know, maybe I'm just going to destroy something that I already have and not gain anything in return. And then I realized, like, you know, I've never resisted something so strong. So maybe it's a sign that this is something that I really have to do. Uh, so, um, so, I, and then I spoke with many people. I mean, networking online is really, really important because you end up with like-minded people. They sort of know what you're doing. They have this ab- objective sort of, you know, vision of looking at things from a side without having all these emotions in place and all that stuff. Uh, so after many conversations, I realized that, you know, this is a time and I really have to do it and I have to make my best so it works. So I recorded the hardest podcast episode I ever had where it was a solo piece, 
me talking about the pivot, me telling them about my plans, and uh, that I wasn't sure what's going to happen, but this is the plan, this is how it is. Uh, from now on, we will be covering slightly different topics and all that. And I was saying that, you know, I hope that you will stick around. Funny thing was that later on when I received a few emails, I realized that how it sounded because I re-listened to the episode. So basically the impression was, you know, I, I was really emotional and, I, you know, it was really hard for me. So I was going through the whole thing saying that, you know, we, we're getting into a new stage, that uh, we already covered most of the things you need to know anyway and all that stuff. So they were expecting that, you know, I was going to say that that's it, I'm quitting, you know, this podcast will no longer exist. So by that time, you know, they were so much expecting that, that when I said, but something else is coming instead, they were really happy. So they were writing like, you know, yeah, of course we will stick around <laughs> because you scared us. You, we thought that you're going away and all that stuff. So it was really nice to know that during these two years, if you really engage with your audience, if you are very responsive to what you're, they, you know, they are telling you, when you create this relationship, and I think creating this intimate relationship through audio is much easier than mm. by blog posts, sure. then, you know, it, it's much easier to do that pivot. I mean, if I did that like three months after podcasting, most probably it wouldn't work because you don't really have that foundation in place. But um, so far it works well. Um, it, uh, the official pivot was about three weeks ago. Uh, I don't see any difference, any decline in my podcast stats, which is really good, which means that, you know, people are not really quitting. Uh, and I think it's a matter of really sort of, you know, uh, strategically um, working on this new brand and gaining new audiences, which are, uh, again, interested in the subjects we will be covering. So you've got the new podcast. It sounds like your audience is stuck with you, which is great. You outlined some different services that you're offering now. And I, I think you have a membership site that you're getting ready to launch as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm really uh, sort of, um, I know that many people sort of make these membership sites and it's a really nice um, place where you get recurring income and you have this stable audience in place. Um, but I wasn't really sure, what, I was just testing the idea. So the idea was actually to have an exclusive online community of people who wanted to establish their brands and grow their audiences. And it would be a place online where people can uh, sort of, you know, have their um, support mechanism because we, like solopreneurs, usually work from home, alone, in front of the computer. Sometimes we're discouraged. Most probably people who are around us are not from that field, so they don't really understand what we go through. And even if we talk to them, it's not exactly what we need in terms of emotional support. So I was thinking that in that one place online, they will get the emotional support. They will get access to me. Uh, twice a month, we will have a live webinars when I will, where I will be covering a certain topic and then ha have a live Q&A. The members will be getting access to watching all the recordings, even if they miss them, or whenever they join, they still can watch all the backup things. And and since it was just the testing of the idea, I decided, like, you know, maybe for people who are just discovering me, committing to a monthly payment would be a little bit of stretch. Um, so I'm doing for few for, for the upcoming two months I'm doing a promotional like you know limited time offer where they just pay forty seven dollars to uh, get a lifetime membership to brand architect um, club and uh, so far we already have thirty members in there and it seems to work we had two live calls already and um yeah it's 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 growing that's that's what i have in place uh i was testing it it seems to work so maybe we'll have you know more things related to that soon so, so if people want to learn more about the membership site where do we send them well it's uh anialexander.com is the website and uh, from there on the menu there is work with me thing and everything that they could possibly do with me is all there on one page Fantastic. Well, I think you are someone who people will want to learn from because, you know, just from this conversation, we've outlined, you know, 
you left your career. You're willing to take risks. You're an action taker. You know, you stick with it. You did over 150 episodes. You develop relationships. You know, all the things that you need to be doing to be successful as an author, as a solopreneur, you're doing everything right. So I can see why people are drawn to you on your podcast and on your membership site. You're certainly someone who I'm going to follow as someone doing all the things I like to see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, yeah, the, I think uh, building relationships is the key. I mean, this is something I uh, advocate all the time because this is something that I think is the biggest part of my success so far because, uh, I mean, you end up knowing people who help you out because you have built this relationship. You end up lending really, really nice guests because of the relationships because I know that these days and probably you know this too many people are uh, hiring agencies to deal with their guests and you know getting you on someone's podcast as a guest and all that stuff and I don't really believe in that because I mean I usually refuse all these agency requests I don't know how you are doing but for me the logic is the following is if the guest who wants to be on my podcast and most probably if he hires that agency he's not a really very successful or big name anyway uh if that person didn't take didn't think that I deserve 2 minutes of his time to write me a personalized email then most probably I shouldn't think that he deserves 45 minutes of my audience time to come and be on my show so yeah relationships I, I think that's the key of everything that's the most important thing yeah I, I think the the relationship and also like you said when you were talking about your podcast you were very conscious that you were providing value to your audience right that you were making sure you had great guests and that you were giving actionable advice you know, it's the the Gary Vanderchuk jab, jab, left hook or whatever, right? It's just give, right? Create something of value, help people. And then when it comes time to ask them to purchase something from you, they're going to be more than um, more than willing to because you've developed that relationship of giving and a value with them. Yes, I mean, I know many people who are great people, very professionally in their field and quite well known. But I never had them as guests on my podcast because I knew that, you know, my audience specifically will not get anything because they are not from that field or, you know, they, they, they can't really, I mean, I couldn't find the common point into bringing them in, although they might add up credibility to the thing, uh, being big names, but I just couldn't see the, the meaning out of it. So it's always, I mean, whatever I'm doing, usually I'm just putting myself in my listeners' shoes and making sure that, you know, they will need that and, and it's something that will bring value. So you just had this big pivot. You've got the membership site on the go. Looking to the year ahead, you know, what are you most excited now about working with people to build their brands? Well, I mean, when, when I was launching Right to be Read, the initial mission was like the ultimate goal that I wanted to have out of it was for someone who has writing as passion, who never actually had this opportunity to, to take it seriously or have something done, to end up with a published book and even a bestseller. So that was the ultimate goal, you know, going through the materials, listening to the things, listening to the guests, uh, making notes, uh, understanding how things work and just going and doing it. Because I also had, apart from the interviews, I also had a solo episode where I was, you know, providing the motivation and the encouragement. And I was sharing with them my own writer's struggles and how I overcame them and all that stuff. So, um, so I, I was very happy that during the period of Write to be Read, I received at least 30 emails from people saying that they published their books purely thanks to the podcast. And that's like the biggest thing. So now, Wonderful. yeah, it's, it's like, you know, this is when, when you receive uh, things like that, you really understand that, you know, it was worth it. And, you know, you whatever you wanted to achieve, you achieved together with them. Uh so now following the same logic uh, with Brand Architect, I would love to have people who are producing great content, who have a good quality message and who, who are really, really nice people but invisible to end up with successful brands and to be uh, to become influencers and well-known people in, in where they want to, to be in their field. So, I mean, once we... 
achieve that, like starting from scratch and actually getting where they want to be. Because I, I think it's a big shame when you end up seeing many nice podcasts, really great blogs, uh, very nice materials online created by people. And, you know, they're not known and no one really reads them just because they're invisible. It's like really, really a shame because there are loads of good quality stuff out there and there are many passionate people, but they just don't have this opportunity to, to get noticed and to stand out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join me on the show on my podcast and to uh, let my audience know, know all the great stuff that you're doing with them. So if they want to learn more about you or work with you on the brand side of things, where should we send them? Okay, so on the alexander.com, uh, work with me section. If they want to listen to the podcast, of course, there is a podcast section as well. Or they can email me directly, directly on the ANI at AniAlexander.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. So there you have it, my interview with Ani Alexander. So if you guys are authors and you're looking, well, not even authors, right? If you guys are entrepreneurs of any kind and you're looking to build your online brand, Ani is the person to go to pop on over, check out her website and look at how you can work with her to build your brand. Now, if you are an author and you're struggling to get that first novel written, I would love to work with you. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching services services as well as a group coaching program for authors. So pop on over to www.kevintjohns.com, click on that coaching tab, and you can learn about how you and I can work together to help you achieve your writing goals. So that's it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Writing Code.